Greetings. Uh, a few days ago, I did a video on the uh, impact that William Lane Craig has had on me. Uh, in this video, I'd like to discuss the relevance, relevance of another person, that being the late uh, Jacob Emanuel Shochet. Now, at this point, those unfamiliar with uh, Shochet might be thinking, well, the previous video about Dr. Craig was about a Christian apologist, so perhaps this video, too, is about a Christian apologist? Uh, in reality, Shochet was not a Christian apologist. In fact, Shochet was not a Christian at all. Uh, he was actually an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, uh, a member of the Hasidic sect known as Chabad Lubavitch. Uh, henceforth, I'll refer to them as the Lubavitchers. Uh, at this point, one might be wondering, okay, Shochet wasn't a Christian, but uh, maybe this video is about him because he was friendly towards the Christian faith? And the answer, again, uh, would be no. Uh, Rabbi Shochet was actually hostile to the Christian faith and uh, sometimes even worked as a counter-missionary attempting to oppose uh, Christians who invite Jews to the Christian faith. Uh, in fact, uh, Rabbi Shochet even had a debate in 1995 with the Jewish Christian apologist Michael Brown. Uh, at this point, one might be wondering, uh, if Shochet was hostile to the Christian faith, uh, what's the point of this video then? You know, why com even compare him to Dr. William Lane Craig? Well, first, permit me to note an interesting little bit of trivia. Uh, William Lane Craig was born on the 23rd of August, 1949. The video I made about him uh, a few days ago was actually posted on his birthday. Uh, Jacob Emanuel Shochet, on the other hand, was born on the 27th of August, 1935, and I'm posting this video on his birthday on the 27th of August. Uh, interestingly, both those dates correspond to the same single date on the rabbinic Hebrew calendar, that being the 28th of the month of Ab. Uh, if one is wondering how a date on the Hebrew calendar can line up with two different dates on the Gregorian calendar, it's because the Hebrew calendar has a different number of days, causing it to shift against the Gregorian, Gregorian calendar from year to year. But the interesting bit of trivia that I wanted to share is that while Craig and Shochet have different birthdays on the Gregorian calendar, they have the same birthday on the Hebrew calendar. That minor point aside, another reason I wanted to make this video is because despite Rabbi Shochet's hostility to the Christian faith, he still made a number of concessions over the years, which Christians might find interesting. And I'd like to go over a few examples of such in this video. The first example I'd like to give is from his 1992 book titled Mashiach, The Principles of Mashiach and the Messianic Era in Jewish Law and Tradition. In the, uh, and I'm actually going to turn to that book now, in the uh, second appendix of the book, Shochet discusses the curious Mashiach ben Yosef. Uh, for those who don't know, ancient rabbinic literature contains a number of references to a certain Messiah, son of Joseph. The Talmud even states that the Hebrew Bible contains cryptic allusions to this figure being slain. Now, naturally, Christians might think to themselves, wait, the Messiah, the son of Joseph, who is to be slain? That sounds a lot like Jesus. Practitioners of rabbinic Judaism, however, would object that the Messiah, son of Joseph, is not the Messiah. Rather, he's a precursor to the Davidic Messiah who comes from the tribe of Ephraim. Uh, Ephraim. Uh, hence, uh, much of the rabbinic corpora distinguishes between a Mashiach ben Yosef and a Mashiach ben David. However, Shochet goes through the subject in that second appendix, and uh, he has a footnote on page 93. It's uh, footnote 2. And uh, that footnote contains... Uh, actually, well, first off, the footnote starts on page 93 and continues on to page 94. And... Uh, in the midst of discussing the Mashiach ben Yosef, who's also called the Mashiach ben Ephraim, and he mentions that, you, you see that here, the Mashiach ben Ephraim, uh, Shochet mentions that a number of, t he, he alludes to a number of texts in the footnote which discuss this figure. And one text he includes is the Pesik Tarabati. And uh, he notes that in the case of this particular source, Let's go to the next page and continuation of the footnote. He notes that in this particular source, the uh, the Ephraim Mashiach, the Mashiach ben Ephraim, as he puts it, well, let's actually let me quote him. He says here the term the the term Ephraim though may relate here to collective Israel, thus referring to the Mashiach ben David. Now 
A concession by an Orthodox Jewish rabbi that the Pesik Tarabati's reference to the Messiah of Ephraim might actually be a reference to the Davidic Messiah is significant, and let me explain why. The Pesik Tarabati says, among other things, that the 22nd Psalm contains a cryptic reference to the relevant figure, this uh, Mashiach ben Ephraim, or our righteous Ephraim, uh, that the 22nd Psalm contains a reference to that figure suffering for the sins of the world. Now think of the implications there. Rabbi Shochet's book indirectly conceded that the 22nd Psalm alludes to the, to the Davidic Messiah, the Messiah, suffering for the sins of the world. Naturally, Christians should find that very interesting. Now, that book from 1992 aside, uh, another place where Shochet is interesting is in his defense of other members of his particular Hasidic sect, the Lubavitchers. Uh, for those who don't know, the Lubavitcher sect long had a belief that their seventh Rebbe, or head rabbi, would be the long-awaited Messiah. Uh, in the 90s, members began publicly declaring that their leader, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, was in fact the Messiah. But then Schneerson died. Some Lubavitchers continued to say that Schneerson is the Messiah even after his death. And this is significant because for centuries, rabbinic Jews have told Christians that if a messianic candidate dies, then his candidacy is negated. He cannot be the Messiah. Period. End of sentence. This has been part of the rabbinic polemic against the belief that Jesus is the Messiah for quite some time, for centuries, nearly a millennia, uh, maybe more. Uh, and as a result, other Orthodox Jews outside of the Lubavitcher sect began sounding the alarm and began criticizing the Lubavitcher sect. Now, Shochet, being one of the more brilliant members of the Lubavitcher sect, began responding to the critics, and an inter-Jewish debate began to take place in public, though many are unaware of it, and that's kind of the point of this video, to reveal some of the more interesting points of that debate which is a lot more vast than what will be covered in this video. Uh, now, in March of 1998, uh, Shochet contributed an article to the Algemeine Journal, which is a bilingual uh, Yiddish-English newspaper based in New York. Uh, the article offered a number of fascinating responses to uh, one of the critics of the Lubavitcher sect. Uh, so, and here's the article here. It actually covered two pages. On the left of this image here, you see... Uh, uh, Rabbi Shochet, and then on the right you see uh, Rabbi uh, Chaim Dov Keller, who was uh, the critic that, of Lubavitchers, which Shochet was responding to in this particular article. So the article is titled uh, God-Centered or Machloket-Centered, which is normative Judaism. Now, Machloket means um, like a, a dispute or something to that effect. And it says a response to Rabbi Chaim Dov Keller. And again, this is uh, from the uh, March 27th uh, 1998 issue of the Algemeiner Journal uh, on pages uh, B3 and B4 in the English section of that bilingual newspaper. So in this article, Shochet, um, you know, he deals with a number of these criticisms. He uh, and he offers a number of fascinating responses to this particular critic of the Lubavitcher sect. Uh, so he addresses the issue of whether the Messiah can come from the dead as well as other points of dispute which have come up, which had come up uh, while the Lubavitchers were being scrutinized by their Orthodox Jewish critics. So I'd like to take a look at a few excerpts from this article. First, on the question of whether the Messiah can come from the dead, Shochet writes the following on the uh, second page of the of the, of the relevant article. So starting at the top of what you see at your screen, he writes, is it possible for a resurrected tzaddik, i.e. a righteous person, is it possible for a resurrected tzaddik to be Mashiach, to be the Messiah? According to Sanhedrin 98b, most definitely yes. He continues, is that view, quote-unquote, normative Jude Judaism? It is certainly not the normative Jewish perception of Mashiach throughout the ages. By the same token, however, it does not violate normative Judaism or halacha, i.e. Jewish law, one iota. The Almighty can appoint anyone he chooses to be Mashiach, to be the Messiah, whether he be, to use the Gemara's expression, of the living or of the presently dead. Think about the implications there. An Orthodox Jewish rabbi is going over sources... Well, let me rephrase that. The, 
this is significant because while rabbinic Jewish counter missionaries have long told Christians that the death of a figure negates or cancels the possibility of that figure being the Messiah, Shochet here reveals that the Babylonian Talmud in Tractate Sanhedrin contains a reference to the possibility of the Messiah coming from the dead. So this later sort of medieval polemic against the possibility of Jesus being the Messiah contradicted an earlier Jewish tradition. Now, that's probably the most significant part of the article, but I'd like to quickly cover a couple other interesting parts, which, while perhaps not relevant to all of mainstream you know, Christianity, the entirety of the mainstream Christian spectrum, might still appeal to those who are in some of the older liturgical churches, like uh, Orthodox Christians and uh, Roman Catholics. For example, there's a portion which might be relevant to the question of iconography. So, if I can turn to there, Shochet writes the following at the top of the sh- uh, screen here. Uh, Rabbi Heller objects to Hasidim, quote, conjuring the image of the Rebbe to strengthen uh, his kashrut uh, with the Rebbe. His kashrut, by the way, means uh, like connection. They were connecting to their, their leader uh, by conjuring up the image. Uh, so Shochet, um, so this Rabbi Chaim Dov Keller objected to this uses of images of the Rebbe to somehow have a connection with him. So here's what uh, Shochet writes in response. He says, uh, once again, he, being uh, Rabbi Keller, mistook his, quote, being not aware of such Torah hash- hashkofot. By the way, uh, hashkofot means like, hashkofa is like a, an opinion. So hashkofot or hashkofos in the Yiddish pronunciation means uh, opinions. So once again, Keller mistook his being not aware of such Torah hashkofot to be a license to be melagleg bedivrei hachamim. Now, um, that means uh, to deride the words of uh, the wise ones, of the sages. Uh, Shochet continues, uh, Rabbi Abba related his continuous hit uh, kashrut with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai to seeing his image before his eyes. And then Shochet gives uh, some sources from the Zohar and uh, some other Kabbalistic sources. And Shochet continues, the Arizal instructs that difficulties in matters of Torah can be overcome by conjuring up the image of your Rebbe. And Shochet gives more sources. Then he continues, the Holy Sar Shalom of Bells stated that when in trouble or need, one should conjure up the image of a tzaddik and then will surely be helped. And then he gives uh, some size sorts, uh, sources for that. Then he continues, this is, gets particularly interesting for me, many authorities relate this to the verse, your eyes shall see your teacher in Isaiah 30.20, to the point that Rabbi Avtalion di Concilia, at the end of the 16th century, writes in his Palge Mayim that he kept a picture of his Rebbe in his Beit Hamidrash in order to fulfill that verse. That, for me, I think is interesting. Again, consider the implications here. An Orthodox Jewish rabbi is going over sources within the rabbinic corpora, and a number of different sources at that, which relate to the permissibility of having an image of one's leader, including, by tacit extension, an image of the Messiah. Now, the final portion I want to look at from this article is admittedly minor, but some Catholics who are fans of St. Francis of Assisi might find it interesting. That's why, this is the only reason I'm going to conclude this. Uh, as uh, some might know, St. Francis of Assisi occasionally engaged in a curious practice where he would open the Bible or a specific gospel to a random page, and then he would treat what was found on that page as a personal message to the person who does such. Uh, Rabbi Shochet addresses a similar practice found among some Orthodox Jews. This is what he writes. Starting at the bottom, he says, Rabbi Keller ob- objects also to people submitting questions and problems to the Rebbe by, quote, writing letters to him and, excuse me, bear with me one second here, writing letters to him and placing them at random in the Rebbe's Igrot Kodesh, i.e. his holy letters, and then considering that page to be the answer. Thus he repeats his habitual error. He rejects the verse that, quote, Have I not written unto you esteemed things of counsels and knowledge, in Proverbs 22.20, as rendered in Midrash Tanhuma and Pesichta, and interpreted to mean that one can find counsel by random opening of Torah text. Now, before Rabbi Keller is tempted to dismiss this, too, as, quote, allegory and metaphor, end quote, he should note that it is cited literally in halachic context. And then, uh... Shochet gives various sources which do this. Now, moving on from this 1998 article, uh, in the year 
2000, another critic of uh, the Messianic Lubavitchers, a rabbi named David Berger, wrote a very interesting book uh, titled The Rebbe, the Messiah, and the Scandal of Orthodox Indifference. I, I have to say it's a very interesting work which reveals just how complex the Orthodox Jewish spectrum can be, and I, re I recommend it for people who would uh, like to explore this subject. Now, as Shochet had responded to previous critics of the Messianic Lubavitcher, so too here he responded to this book by David Berger. As later that year, later in the year 2000, he wrote a review of the book uh, for the Lubavitcher-run uh, site, sh news site, uh, shmeis.com. Uh, note the parody on the book's title. While the while the uh, the book was titled "The Rebbe, the Messiah, and the Scandal of Orthodox Indifference," uh, Professor Shochet's review of the book is titled "The Professor, the Messiah, and the Scandal of Calumnies." <laughs> now, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the review seems to have disappeared from the site, but an archived version can still be found on the internet. And uh, I'd like to take a look at that now. So if you excuse me for one second, I'm going to pull that up. Here's the archived version of the uh, of the review by Shochet, which he wrote late in the year 2000. Uh, again, uh, it's titled The Professor, the Messiah, and the Scandal of Calumnies. And it's a review of Rabbi David Berger's The Rebbe, the Messiah, and the Scandal of Orthodox Indifference. One major point of uh, the critique of the Messianic Lubavitchers found in uh, Rabbi Berger's book was that for centuries, various Jewish authorities, a number of different Jewish authorities, have told Christians that a person who dies cannot be the Messiah. Shochet's response to that is quite intriguing, and I think it will constitute the most interesting portion of this video. So I want to show what Shochet writes in this regard. If you'll bear with me for a second, I'm going to scroll down to the third section of his review. Bear with me. Here's the third section, and then it's the third portion of the third section. Okay, so again, Rabbi Berger pointed out that in many debates and polemics between Jews and Christians, you know, the, a number of very prominent Jewish authorities and rabbis have, have ob objected that if a Messianic candidate dies, he can't be the Messiah, his candidacy is canceled, it's, it's negated, right? So this is what Rabbi Shochet writes in his review. David Berger relies heavily on arguments in medieval polemics. It is of major concern to him that, quote, one of the defining, defining characteristics of Judaism in a Christian world will have been erased, end quote, by the possibility of a res resurrected Messiah. In truth, of course, the Jewish faith is defined by its own tradition and not by its differences from Christianity. Polemical debates, regardless of their participants, are neither definitive nor authoritative. The Talmudic rabbis engaged in such debates as well. Oftentimes, they conceded that they rebuffed their opponents with quote-unquote straw or quote-unquote broken reeds, i.e. that their responses were no more than polemical tactics and not their true positions. A typical example would be the Jewish responses about the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. The polemicists, who follow the majority opinion of medieval Jewish exegetes, hold that it speaks of the Jewish people, as opposed to the Christian claim that it speaks of the Messiah. This view is also found among some Talmudic rabbis. It does not negate, however, the validity of the pervasive Talmudic, Midrashic, Zoharic interpretation that the subject of the chapter is indeed Mashiach, is indeed the Messiah. For me, that's a fascinating mic drop of a response. A portion that Christians should find interesting is the concession that even if prominent rabbis make a claim in their responses to Christians, that claim may not reflect their actual positions and may obscure what can actually be found in the rabbinic corpora. That's an incredible point which should be kept in mind. Now, in closing, I'd like to bring up William Lane Craig one last time. In uh, March of 2005, Dr. Craig appeared on Lee Strobel's show, Faith Under Fire, to discuss the Trinity with uh, the Jewish counter-missionary Rabbi Tovia Singer. Being a fan of Craig, I actually watched that show the night it aired on the uh, PAX channel in New York. And uh, I was struck by how Rabbi Singer, who happens to be an Orthodox Jew, seemed to conveniently omit certain details about the Torah and rabbinic tradition during his responses to Craig. In the years since then, 
I've seen Rabbi Singer do that several other times in various other contexts. So I want to share that I intend in the near future to make a video on that subject, discussing how Rabbi Singer depicts a subject versus how the more complex and nuanced way that subject is handled within rabbinic tradition. And uh, I think it's very interesting, and I wanted to mention that here because uh, the words of Rabbi Shochet should be the uh, can be the inspiration for that sort of expl exploration. Keep in mind that what a rabbi says in his polemics against Christianity doesn't necessarily reflect his own position and doesn't limit what's possible within the rabbinic spectrum. And so that's going to be a theme in a future video that I hope to do on the subject of uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer and his uh, polemics against Christianity. God willing. Until then, I'll close here and say that I hope others found this video interesting. I look forward to the comments of others. God bless.